All right, we are live. Welcome to today's Vet Girl YouTube Live. We're going to be talking about what happens at the dog park doesn't stay at the dog park. It sounds like maybe one of those Vegas rules, right? I don't know. Where does it end up on social media these days? I think Dr. Little's going to let us know, but welcome. It is good afternoon for me. I think it may be good morning still for Dr. Dr. Little and Dr. Lee, maybe it's good evening to you out there all over the country or all over the world. You know, we do this every time. Please go ahead and type in where you are logging in from, from around the country or around the world. They already know, Justine. I mean, I already have, even before I said it, we have Oregon, Jersey, Minnesota, Florida, Australia. See, Dr. Little, nice. I told you, all over nice. the world. Vegas, Pennsylvania. Hello from Too Hot Phoenix. Well, Lorraine, we're going to be in your neck of the woods in about a week and a half down in Scottsdale for Becker LU. So please go ahead and continue to type in where you are logging in from. We love to hear it. Personally, me, I'm looking out my window right now and it is kind of cloudy Pennsylvania. Justine, what about you? I am based out of uh, Too Hot Minnesota right now. We're supposed to have 100 degrees this week, which makes us Minnesotans uh, melt. So uh, I'm dying of heat here. And Dr. Little, what about you? Same, over 100 every day for as far as we can see. Way too <laughs> oh, hot. Oh, man. Well, I hope everyone has some good AC or at least a, a pool, lake, or pond to jump into. We have we have our friend from Portugal, Iowa, New York, Washington, D.C., or Washington State, I should say, Austin, Texas, so all over. Well, as you guys continue to go ahead and type in where you're logging in from, let's get this party started for our YouTube Live and the first thing I wanted to say is a, give a big shout out to Alenko for being here with us today. They're one of our amazing educational partners. And thanks to them, we are able to provide this completely complimentary race approved CE session to everyone out there. So thank you so much to Alenko for helping us support this mission of veterinary education. With that said, I just told you it's race approved. So how are you going to get your race certificate? You know this if you've been on a YouTube session with us before. First things first, Justine is going to put this link, tinyurl.com forward slash, and then VG for Vet Girl, and then today's date, 7-25-23. Justine's going to put that into that little question screen, a little comment screener. Click on that, or that's a QR code. If you use your fancy phone, put that little camera up to the QR code. It'll open up that same link. By 1 p.m. Eastern today. So this session's 30 minutes. We're giving you an extra 30 minutes after the session. Please fill out that form. When you fill out that form, you must use the email address associated with your Vet Girl account. By about 1.30, 2 p.m. Eastern today, probably, I will then put your certificate into your Vet Girl account for you, your My Credits page. We no longer email them to you. We drop them directly into your account. So please, by 1 p.m. Eastern, Fill out that form, and when you do, use your email address associated with your Vet Girl account. Whether it's an elite account, a free account, doesn't matter. Just associate it with that. As we are on YouTube, I, sometimes you start out with that tiny little rectangle box. Well, if you click on that bottom right-hand corner open box that I have my arrow on right now, you can make it full screen so you can see us in full Technicolor as big as your device will allow. If you're not familiar with Vet Girl, we certainly hope that you check us out. And if you are, we certainly hope you're doing our Vet Girl certificate program. So we now have 11 different certificate programs that are part of your Vet Girl membership. So you can become more proficient in that area that makes you a better practitioner, a better nurse, technician, veterinarian, practice manager, whatever it may be. These are there for you. Please take full advantage of your membership. If you're not yet a Vecrol member, check out our Vecrol trial membership. You get complete website access for 14 days so you can get a feel of our style, our content, our depth and breadth, and decide, do I want to become a Vecrol member? We certainly hope after seeing what Vecrol has for you and your team, you decide you want to join and become a true full-fledged Vecrol member. And I think it was Lorraine earlier, I forget, I apologize, who said they were in too hot Phoenix. Well, we are going to be in too hot Scottsdale in just a couple days, week, week and a half, we're about sold out. So if you were thinking about it, I would log on to our website ASAP. I think we have maybe one veterinarian. We're sold out left, on the maybe. best spot. Oh, sold out. We just yeah. happened. And maybe one or two technicians. So you can try. We're going to get a wait list up as soon as possible. I think we had one cancellation coming the other day. So maybe if you're lucky. Otherwise, stay tuned. We don't want to have too much FOMO. Maybe we'll see it 2024. All right. 
I know you're not here to listen to myself or Justine, at least today. We're here to listen to Dr. Little. So Dr. Little, again, thank you so much for being here with us today. If you can give our audience a little bit of a background of who you are, what you love doing, and then please take it away. The floor is yours. That sounds great. Thanks so much. And thanks everybody for joining. And I'm so grateful to Vet Girl for creating this platform and for Elenco for sponsoring so that we could all be here today to talk about what I love doing, which is parasites, parasite control, uh, veterinary parasitology, just all things parasites. And I think that'll become apparent as we go through some of this content today. Um, I am a veterinarian and a parasitologist at Oklahoma State University in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Uh, before that, I was on faculty for about 10 years at University of Georgia. So the parasites are amazing in the Southern US, but they're everywhere as we're gonna see as we go through some of this data. And as you heard earlier, the topic for today's talk is what happens at the dog park doesn't stay at the dog park. And so we are going to talk a little bit about dog parks. The first time I gave this presentation was in Las Vegas. And so that was the sort of inspiration for that uh, title that we use. But it really speaks to the fact that dogs and their owners go to dog parks. They you know, take a parasite, leave a parasite. They might get infected there. They might leave something behind there, share it with other dogs. It is a potential source of parasites for dogs. And that's been shown in a number of different publications from across, uh, really across the globe, but certainly in the U.S. Uh, Mike Lappin's group at Colorado State showed very nicely that park attending dogs have a statistically higher rate of infection, prevalence of infection with Giardia and Cryptosporidium than dogs that don't go to dog parks. So there's, there's probably some risk with any time you go to a share use facility with a lot of other dogs. But really, dogs don't have to go to the dog park to get parasites. They can get parasites, you know, out on their nightly walk around the neighborhood where the other dogs have gone, playing in the yard with other dogs, going to a boarding kennel, going to um, a, a um, groomer, any kind of shared use facility. So uh, back in 2019, Elenco, IDEX, and, and us at Oklahoma State University decided to do this national survey of dog parks and just say, okay, of the dogs that are going to dog parks, just as a sort of cross-section of pet dogs in the U.S., how many of them are infected with parasites? And so that's the first paper that's shown on this slide for you. And we were so proud of that clever um, acronym and as you'll see on the next slide, we just call it the dog park study, but parks with a C. So detection of gastrointestinal parasites at recreational canine sites. And, and I just love that. It was not my idea. It was one of the veterinarians at Alenka that came up with that title, but it really does capture Yes, we went to dog parks, but it's really anywhere dogs gather, anywhere dogs have been, there's likely to be parasites that some dogs left behind that other dogs can now become infected with. So this study, this the key dog park study that I'll refer to was conducted in 2019. We went to 288 parks across 30 different metro areas in the U.S., tested over 3,000 dogs. Um, we never, we collected about 10 samples per dog park because we didn't want to bias our data by having a lot of samples from like the real one really wormy park, right? So in every of the 30 metro areas, we went to eight or 10 different parks to get those samples. And then we talked to the dog owners. And yeah, this was awkward because, you know, you're, first of all, you're at the dog park without a dog, which is odd. And then you're going up to people asking for the feces that their dog just defecated, right? So um, we introduced ourselves and explain we were doing this survey. Sometimes we offered a Starbucks gift card as like a reason to talk to us, um, had those conversations with owners so that we wouldn't just have samples for testing, but we would also learn more about, you know, does the dog go to the veterinarian? Is the dog on parasite control? Has he ever been infected with a parasite before? Just asking them some really basic questions. And then those fecal samples were submitted to IDEX for their fecal DX and for Giardia testing. So that means they were tested by fecal flotation with centrifugation, fecal antigen testing for whipworms, hookworms, and roundworms, and then Giardia antigen testing as well. So we had really good comprehensive data on what parasites these dogs might have at the dog park. And it won't surprise you to see on the next slide that we've got a lot of parasites at the dog park. So across those over 3,000 dogs, one in five, were infected with parasites. And that's just one sample tested one day, right, at one dog park. And still over 20% of the dogs had parasites. We found parasites at over 85% of the parks. And the parasites we found are shown there on the right-hand side of the screen 
hookworms and whipworms and giardia. Those are the most common parasites that we see in adult dogs. Hookworms and whipworms are always the most common nematodes identified in any survey of adult dogs done really anywhere in the world. And that's certainly true in our survey. And it was true, uh, it's true throughout the US. Um, we do see a lot of giardia as well, but in terms of nematodes, hookworms and whipworms. Now, roundworms certainly happen in dogs. They happen in puppies, but not so much adult dogs. And the majority of dogs at the dog park were um, over 12 months of age. And so we're gonna see hookworms and whipworms. And so when we um, did that study, we also compared different regions. And yes, parasites were common in the Southern US. Um, there are a lot of parasites in the uh, great climate of the South, but they were just as common statistically in the Midwest. So 87% of parks in the Midwest and 90% of parks in the South had at least one dog with parasites. And really they were common in the Northeast and the West as well. 79 to 80% of parks had a at least one infected dog. And remember, we only tested 10 dogs per park. So if we had tested 20 or 50 or 100 dogs, I think we would have found parasites at every park that we attended. And then we'll, as we look, you know, I talked about hookworms, whipworms, and giardia being most common. So those are the ones that I'm going to spend some time on today and talk about how we control them. And I'll start with hookworms because hookworms are the most common intestinal nematode that we find in dogs. That's true. You can see that on the CAPC vet data that's posted online. Um, it was certainly true in the dog park survey. And one of the reasons for that is that reinfection is so common. So we've got a short prepatent period of just two to three weeks and dogs can get reinfected either by ingesting the larvae from the environment or through skin penetration with the larvae. Um, and of course that skin penetration is legendary because it's associated with cutaneous larva migrans or zoonotic hookworm infection in people. So I always remind folks, don't go barefoot at the dog park. And I know you're probably thinking who would go barefoot at the dog park? dogs go barefoot at the dog park. So even if it's not a dog that ingests, um, you know, dirt from the ground where they might ingest some larvae, they can be infected just from walking around an area where a dog with hookworms has defecated, those eggs have hatched, the larvae are now out there and they're penetrating the skin. And then we do see larval leak occur. So if dogs have somatic tissue stores, after we deworm them, they might continue to become reinfected from without even having to be infected from the environment, just from their own somatic tissue stores. Then lately we've seen reports of resistance. And so I'll spend a little bit of time talking about resistance, first in greyhounds, but now we see it in all breeds of dogs, even multi-drug resistance. And we care about hookworm infection because it's common for sure, but also because it's um, it can be devastating, can create anemia and even uh, mortality in dogs when they have a really heavy hookworm infection. And they're likely to get that. Maybe they bring hookworms home from the dog park or from their nightly walk. Now there's larvae in the backyard. They get infected with more and with more. And if there's not control, effective control on board, if we aren't doing anything to break that cycle, then they can tip over into clinically significant anemia and even death. I mentioned resistance, and so I do want to just spend a little bit of time. Um, if you haven't seen a case of hookworm, Ancelostoma caninum, that are resistant to antomintics, you likely will at some point in the not so distant future because we're getting more and more reports of canine hookworm that we that are difficult to clear with antelmintics that should work because historically they did work. Now, how do we know it's resistance? If you diagnose hookworm, deworm the dog, two weeks later, within 10 to 14 days, repeat that fecal. If you're still seeing eggs, that's when you first suspect there may be resistance. At that point, the recommendation is to collect a fecal sample and do a quantitative fecal egg count, which you can do through the National Service Labs or through your state veterinary diagnostic labs, um, and then triple deworm. So that means give pyrantal, a benzimidazole like fenbendazole or febantal, and a macrocyclic lactone, and topical moxidectin is, is what's been used in the research and was usually recommended. And then if 10 to 14 days later, there's not been a significant change, you repeat the fecal egg count. And if there's not been a significant decrease in the fecal egg count from before, that suggests multi-drug resistance. And now you'll need to go off-label with a different drug altogether. The one that's recommended, it, that's used is emodepside, but it comes with a lot of safety cautions. And so it should not be used casually or just because you think it might, you know, be a resistant, you really want to confirm with laboratory data that you do have resistance and you have a need to go to emodepside because there are some toxicities that can result and some safety concerns. And those are covered really nicely in this clinician's brief article from a few years ago, but you just want to make sure you get the dose right, the administration correct, it should be administered in clinic by the veterinarian um, to make sure it's as safe as possible for that dog. 
The other parasite, remember I talked hookworms, but we also see whipworms and we saw whipworms in the dog park study and we certainly see whipworms um, in animal shelter dogs, in uh, pet dogs across the US. Now this dog, this necropsy photo just shows a dramatic whipworm infection in this dog's colon. You can see just decimated the mucosa. In the next slide, you'll see something similar with just a mass of whipworms. They're embedding their anterior end down into the mucosa causing fluid loss. Um, so severe it can even lead to electrolyte imbalance in the dogs, and then of course blood loss directly through the large intestine. And so whipworms do cause clinical disease, but what's frustrating or um, also as important as the clinical disease they cause is how difficult they can be to diagnose. And so on the next slide, you'll see a comparison of different diagnostic strategies for intestinal parasites. So you, we might do direct smear, which we all know is not very effective at all. It will only pick up a minority of the parasite infections. And then there's the passive flotation, fecalizer or ova assay, where it's just a countertop flotation and you just rely on gravity to let the eggs float up and the debris float down or sink down. And it might work okay for hookworms. You can see 70% in this 10-year survey of the different methods used, about 70% of hookworm infections were picked up, only 60% of roundworm infections, but less than half whipworm infections are gonna be picked up by those passive flotations. And that's why every parasitologist recommends centrifugation for fecal flotation. We have to, have to use that centrifugal force to support flotation of the eggs so that they'll be available under the cover slip and can be identified. It's important, it helps a lot with hookworms and roundworms, but you can see with um, zinc sulfate centrifugation, which is the strategy used by the National Service Labs and used by a lot of labs, um, it helps with whipworm detection, right? You'll get 80% of the whipworm eggs, so you'll be able to identify 80% of the infection, but you're still missing 20%. So you can look at that as like the fecal glass is 80% full or 20% empty. You're still going to be failing to identify a lot of those whipworm infections. And that's a huge problem because we want to be able to identify those infections as early as possible, treat those dogs before they contaminate their backyard, have more eggs out there that are going to be very long lived in the environment and have created a risk of infection in their own home, right? We want to find those, we want to find those infections as soon as possible. And there's been a number of papers that have documented this that have shown um, that we really have to do active centrifugal flotation. And I would add that in addition to centrifugal flotation, the antigen tests that were used in the, in the dog park survey data that I showed you um, add so much more. They contribute so much more to identifying as many of those infections as possible so that we can treat the dogs and, and get them cleared. Now, whipworms matter um, because of the clinical disease that they can cause. So there is pathogenesis associated with trichuris vulpus infections in dogs. Um, I mentioned that electrolyte imbalance. You can also get necrosis of the lymphoid follicles. You can get really severe um, permanent damage to the integrity of the mucosa of the large intestine when a whipworm infection is allowed to persist. And so we we want to make sure we limit whipworm infections as much as possible. But on the next slide, you'll see a fecal flotation from a dog that was on a monthly parasite control product. So the owners, you know, were following their veterinarian's recommendation. They were giving their dog monthly parasite control and yet massive whipworm infection detected at their annual fecal. The reason for this might be clear to some of you, but if we go back just to the slide for just a second, I just want to talk about the um, whipworm eggs. The reason that there's eggs, even though the dog's on monthly parasite control, is because if it's an ivermectin pyrantel-based preventive, it's not going to clear whipworm infections. It's not labeled for whipworms. It's not supposed to clear whipworms, and sure enough, it doesn't. If if the dog's on a monthly pyrantel moxidectin serolaner drug, that's not labeled for whipworms, not effective against whipworms, and so won't clear it. In order to not see a fecal flotation like this in a dog on monthly parasite control, it has to be either an oral milbomycin or a topical moxidectin product because the others are just not effective against whipworms. And the same is true if a dog's on an injectable long-term moxidectin for heartworm prevention. Fantastic heartworm prevention, but it's not going to get the monthly parasite control and it doesn't have efficacy against whipworms. Now there's other parasites too um, that we can see even though we don't find them on our fecal float. So with whipworms, best practice, if you're just doing fecal flotation, you're gonna maybe miss 20% of the infections. With Diplodium caninum, the flea tapeworm, because the proglottids are shed um, intermittently and because the eggs are so heavy, they don't float well on fecal flotation, we're gonna miss, in this dog with Diplodium caninum, if I did a fecal float, 
four grams of feces, centrifugal flotation, I would find about 5% of the time I would be able to identify the infection. In other words, 95% of dogs coming into veterinary practices with flea tapeworms are going to go right back home with their flea tapeworms, even if a fecal float is, is done, because the eggs are just not um, present in the feces in a way they can be identified. And so the dog in this slide is Zena. Zena was adopted from an animal shelter in Oklahoma. So she had hookworms, whipworms, and heartworm because uh, shelter dogs in the southern U.S., including in Oklahoma, are likely to be infected. She was treated for hookworms and whipworms. She was being treated in the process of treatment for heartworm. She's very happy to be in her new home. Um, and a repeat fecal exam was done after the hookworm and whipworm treatment, and it was no parasite seen. And so the owners were told, that's great. Here's the preventive to keep her that way. She goes outside, and the grass right outside the clinic defecates, and you can see the proglottids there. So now the veterinary staff are tasked with the awkward conversation of saying, oh, well, we said no parasites, but we didn't mean those really obvious parasites that you can see. We meant other parasites that you can't see that one we didn't treat for, right? And so we now know that 40 to 50% of dogs in animal shelters in the Southern US are infected with flea tapeworms, Diplodium caninum, and they would benefit from Praziquantel treatment. And a lot of the shelters have already implemented that in their protocol and just go ahead and routinely treat dogs with Praziquantel because they know more likely than not, the dog is gonna be infected with flea tapeworms. Now, flea tapeworms also have a short prepatent period. They're kind of like hookworms, that two to three week prepatent period. So from the time the dog ingests the flea until they see proglottids again is just two to three weeks. So when we institute praziquantel treatment for diplidium, we also have to institute effective flea control or else reinfection is all but assured from that that contaminated environment. And often when there's failure to clear a dog of diplidium, a flea tapeworm, it's because um, there's been a failure of flea control. So those two really have to go hand in hand. There have been a small number of reports of resistance of diplidium to praziquantel, but it's nothing like what we see with hookworm, ancelostoma caninum, resistance to antelmintics. It's not even as common, commonly identified or reported as heartworm, diaflaria imitus, resistant to macrocyclactones. But there have been a couple case reports and so or case series. And so I do just want to mention that resistance can occur. And if we look, you know, when so when do you think, well, it might be resistance? Like I gave the dog praziquantel, but I'm still seeing proglottids. If you're seeing proglottids five days, seven days after giving the praziquantel, that suggests resistance because it failed to, to clear the infection. But if it's two to three weeks later or longer, then that suggests flea control is the issue, right? And you're actually getting a reinfection from existing flea or possibly a, a louse infestation that's allowing, you still have that intermediate host, and so it's allowing reinfection. Unfortunately, we don't have quantitative assays that can say, yes, this is likely resistance or no, it isn't. So there's no fecal egg count that can be done with diplidium because the eggs aren't even present, present in feces in a reliable way to begin with. Um, and there's just not a, a good way to confirm it. But if you've definitely got good flea control in place, the dog's being kept up so it doesn't have, you know, an opportunity to ingest fleas from another environment that have gone unnoticed, um, and you've treated repeatedly with praziquantel at two-week intervals, and you're still seeing proglottids, then you might want to reach for another antelmintic. Again, this has only been reported in dogs and only in a handful of animals, and so we don't think it's a widespread issue at this time. And then just a summary, parasiticide resistance. I'm sorry to be the harbinger of bad parasite news, but um, what our colleagues in large animal medicine have been struggling with for many decades, we are now seeing emerge in small animal parasitology. So probably first, most dramatically with heartworm, diaphylar imidus resistant to macrocyclic lactones. Now with ancelostoma caninum resistant to sometimes all the antelmintics we have available for dogs. And then rarely um, we might see a diplidium antelmintic resistance. So we just have to think about those life cycles, how the dogs are getting reinfected. Was the drug actually given the way we prescribed it to be given? Is it resistance or just less than 100% efficacy, which we can see with some of the drugs? And could it be the dogs maybe appears to be infected because of coprophagy, right? So that's not a true false, that's not a false positive. There's really eggs in the feces, but if it's Toxicara cat eye eggs, it's because the dog got into the cat's litter box, not because it's infected with Toxicara cat eye. So that's the parasiticide resistance 
or, or intestinal nematode helminth content. And then I just want to mention Giardia because we see Giardia in dogs commonly across the U.S. And so just a quick refresher, a few slides on Giardia. We certainly saw Giardia in the dog park study. Anywhere from 12 to 14 percent of the dogs that were tested were positive, infected with Giardia, and about three quarters of the parks. And if we go on to the next slide, you can see that that's not too surprising because 13% of the dogs and dogs parks were infected. And sure enough, when IDEX reviewed some of its wellness visit data, about 12% of the dogs tested positive. Now, in some of the older surveys that were done, it was only 4%, but those surveys were done by fecal flotation alone, not with the addition of antigen testing. So you add antigen testing, you're going to identify more infections for sure. And so that 10 to 15% is the rate that we expect to see just of a cross section of dogs. Now, does that really matter, right? Well, it does. But if you look at the age breakdown of dogs with Giardia, younger dogs over, you know, about a third of dogs under 12 months of age when tested just once are going to test positive for Giardia. As they age, as they develop immunity, that prevalence will go down. And so Giardia is, is part of the normal experience of being a dog in the world, just getting infected, developing immunity, and then being able to limit that infection. But of course, sometimes it's pathogenic. And, and if the dog also has diarrhea, then it needs to be treated as a, as a pathogen. One concern about Giardia, besides the fact that it can induce diarrhea in some dogs in some situations, is the zoonotic risk. And so here I've just shown the assemblages of Giardia. And uh, I'm going to make a case here for something that may be shocking if it's been a while since you've thought about the zoonotic risk associated with Giardia. But the consensus now is that there isn't a significant zoonotic risk, if it's zoonotic at all, from Giardia infections in dogs and cats to be transmitted to people in North America. And I'll show you why I say that. But the the genetic, uh, morphologically, they're identical, the Giardia from dogs, Giardia from, from people. But if you break them down into assemblages, dogs are most commonly infected with C and D, whereas humans get A1, A2, and then B3, B4. And there doesn't appear to be a lot of crossover. So if you look at what the, the recommendations are based on that data, on the next slide, you can see that from the different uh, bodies that that make recommendations about Giardia control, whether it's CAPC or CDC or the public health group at Iowa State, as you can see on the next slide. Um, the recommendations are that it's not been conclusively demonstrated in North America that humans become infected from dogs and cats. And so the good news is if it's an asymptomatic infection in a dog, the zoonotic risk is small if it's a risk at all. Now, if it was an immunocompromised uh, human uh, owner, then I would be uh, more cautious for sure. I think we all would just immunocompromised in general. You want to be more cautious, but it's just a theoretical risk. And so most of those infections that we see in, in dogs are, are not considered zoonotic. And if you go to the next slide, the problem we have with Giardia is it's so hard to get those negative tests, right? So we want to, we have an infection in a dog. If the dog's clinically normal, then I don't worry as much about trying to get the test to go negative, right? Because we're not treating the, the test, we're treating the dog. There's a few exceptions that dog daycare is mentioned on this slide as well. And so we have to always think about that. But with Giardia, it's a very short prepatent period, usually about a week, six to eight days. So you want to repeat the fecal, you want to test again within five days of finishing the treatment. So usually right at the end, within one to five days of finishing the treatment. And if you're having trouble clearing the infection, bathing towards the end of treatment is also recommended. And if they test negative one to five days after finishing treatment and then positive again two to three weeks later, that suggests a reinfection. And sometimes it's reinfection from ingesting cysts from their own, their own fur, their own hair coat that they've shed while um, defecating. And that's why the bathing is so important. Now, what do we do about the dog daycares that require those negative tests? Well, if the treatment's effective, then testing one to five days after finishing treatment, that should be negative. But it really doesn't mean much because yes, they can be reinfected a week later, a month later, and be shedding again. But there um, are ways to, to address that if, if that's the requirement of the, of the group that you're working with. And so just overall, you know, we want to make sure we recognize parasites are just as common across the U.S. that we have to use preventives to, for the canine health, for the patient health, but also because of the zoonotic risk and particularly in the case of tapeworms to protect the human-animal bond because tapeworms are so gross in, in anybody's um, pet dog. And so parasite control remains important for wellness care. 
And with that, I'll be happy to take any questions y'all might have. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Totally outside of my expertise, but I'll ask you about my dog, Guardia, later, uh, which is also resistant. So love the information. And again, I just wanted to give a huge thank you to Alanco for sponsoring today's uh, YouTube Live so we can give you 30 free minutes of race approved CE. So feel free to type in your questions. I already put into the chat uh, the link in order to get your CE certificate. So make sure to fill out that form. It's going to close in 30 minutes so we know it's live. And again, we'll, uh, we'll make sure to get, uh, upload your CE certificate to my account under your Becquerel account. All right, a bunch of questions that I see here. Now, um, thank you for reiterating all this important information. I was saying, I see people walking barefoot at dog park oh my along God. the Mississippi River. And like, I don't want to disclose I'm a veterinarian, but I'm so repulsed by it. Are there any public programs to decontaminate these parks or any policies with biosecurity measures um, just to make sure that we're reducing that zoonotic risk? Yeah, that's such a great question. There's not, and it's a problem. There's not even the great majority of parks, there's no entry requirement. You don't, there's a few uh, community parks where they do require vaccination, right? As you should with any shared use facility, um, proof of vaccination for the dogs. But there's not um, parks that require proof of parasite control. And that would make such a difference for contamination, you know, at the source, right? Make sure the dogs are on parasite control to protect them, but also protect the park. In terms of decontaminating, the Giardia cysts live longer in water. So having a water feature at a dog park is probably a bad idea. I know the dogs love it and the owners love it, but it's maybe not great for, for infection control. The hookworm larvae will live maybe a month at the outside, maybe two, because they're they're out there moving around. They're susceptible to UV degradation, to drying out. So the hookworm larvae aren't going to be long lived. I mean, a month or so, but not very long lived. Whipworm eggs are forever. And so those whipworm eggs, once they're deposited in the soil, there is no way to get rid of them. Short of doing a prescribed burn, which you probably wouldn't do in a dog park, you could pave uh, like asphalt and lock them in, or you could remove the top 10 inches of topsoil. So there's just not reasonable strategies to clean up the environment. And that's why parasitologists are so uh, enthusiastic about making sure dogs are on parasite control, because we know once it's contaminated with whipworm eggs and roundworm eggs, roundworm eggs are also very long lived. They're forever. They're going to be there for years. Great information. Thank you so much. And again, I don't think any city uh, is going to implement those measures, right? Mm -hmm. It's just too, it's not co uh, cost effective for them. They're not going to see the importance of it. So really important that we as veterinary professionals uh, make sure that we're abiding by that. Now, I see a couple of great questions about um, what we can do to reduce that resistance. Like, should we be reducing use of deworming drugs? As previously stated by the guidelines, or are we deworming only based on fecal analysis or based on clinical signs? Um, some studies tell us that um, an important number of dogs and cats have internal parasites, even when the fecal test is negative. And again, reiterates what you said, doing the right fecal test to begin with. But what do we do? Yeah, it's it's complicated. And it's further complicated by the fact that I realize this uh, presentation is available globally. And so what we do in the US is different than what's done in some European countries. What's done in Southern Europe is different than what's done in Northern Europe. And so I can't generalize across the globe, but I can tell you that in, the, in North America, for sure, um, Capsi's mantra is every dog, every month, all year long, because we know that infection risk is out there and reinfection happens. And without deworming, we're allowing zoonotic parasites to persist in dogs. And therefore, they're going to be in the, you know, the human's backyard. And there's a risk of human infection. And that, that's something that we've decided as a profession um, that we, we aren't, we're not going to tolerate. There are countries, however, where antelmintics are regulated differently and where you have to have a test result before you can administer the dewormer. And so, of course, you always have to follow your local regulations with deworming. Wonderful. Thank you. And I should reiterate that too. Yes, we have people from all over the world who are watching this from Portugal to Mexico to, to uh, Eastern Europe. So great information. All right. I see a great question on Giardia, which is helpful for my own puppy. Uh, what's your recommendation for treating Giardia when the fecal tests continue to show cysts despite multiple rounds of treatment with fenbendazole plus or minus metronidazole? Um, and I think, you know, there's obviously some confusion on the tests of PCR versus antigen staying positive forever. Should we monitor if they're not clinical? If they're not clinical, you're done. 
And I know that's like, um, it almost like your brain explodes, like, like, how can you be done when you're still getting a positive test result? But you just have to trust the immune system of the dog. There was a time when Giardia was considered a commensal. We now know that it indeed is pathogenic, that it does induce diarrhea. And so a dog with diarrhea with Giardia benefits from femendazole treatment. If the clinical signs persist, even if they're intermittent, the thing that I love about femendazole is you can go, I always recommend five days. The protocols will say three to five days, but I always start with five days, but you can go seven days, you can go 14 days. There's not toxicity concerns with it. With metronidazole, there there are. And so you want to keep the dose short and the duration short, the dose low and the duration short with metronidazole. But with fenbendazole, you could go 30 days and it's, it's okay. Now, if the dog's not responding to fenbendazole treatment, and what I would recommend, if you think it's Giardia, that's, that's, um, causing the clinical signs to continue, test while the dog's on fenbendazole, right? So that you know you've you've treated that infection and see if you get a negative test then. And then if it becomes positive again after the dog's off fenbendazole, that suggests reinfection from some sort of environmental environmental source. And then think about all the other things we do with diarrhea. And so you know, probiotics, dietary management, um, thinking about the water source for that dog. There's lots of things that cause diarrhea and the Giardia could just be along for the ride and it might not be the main etiologic agent on that in that dog. Wonderful, thank you. You know, obviously veterinary medicine is a cookbook and you know, we have to do what we can to, to make it work. That's why it's called clinical practice. Um, so again, great information. It's often hard, like if you have a French bulldog or a greyhound that you look at cross-eyed and it gets diarrhea. So yeah, like, absolutely. Oh, or is it just dress? So great information. Yeah. All right. Um, I wanted to ask a question um, that Terry had brought up when it comes to animal shelters. What are your recommendations for parasite control when there's little control over the prior care of the incoming dog? They're coming, we're assuming from, you know, Southeast, South Central United States, um, in from warmer locations. They have shared spaces for, you know, doggy socialization and for dog walks. Uh, what's your general recommendation for uh, shelter medicine? Yeah, so broad spectrum deworming. And we're seeing that now. We've done some work lately, uh, research with different shelters on what their protocols are. And many shelters have embraced broad spectrum deworming, something like milbomycin, praziquantel, combination deworming at intake to the shelter, because you're going to take care of hookworms, roundworms, whipworms, the diplidia tapeworms, Tinea kind of caucus, right? You get praziquantel broad tapeworm control. And so that, it just makes such a difference. And we think we've seen in the data, we didn't set the study up to ask this question, but we had a chance to analyze some data recently. And it looked like um, shelters in the South were actually decreasing prevalence of dipalidium caninum significantly by administering praziquantel at intake. So that makes a huge difference. And then the other big piece that I know we're not talking about as much, but heartworm, right? So making sure that your heartworm tests, I mean, we just assume dogs from the Southern US in animal shelters are infected with heartworm. And we don't think otherwise until they're a year or more out, right? Till they've been adopted on preventive and they continue to test negative a year or more out because we do see so many um, early infections. Wonderful. Thank you. Now, I did want to ask uh, one last question. And before I do, again, I just want to give a huge shout out and thank you to Lenko uh, for being able to provide the CE uh, to everybody and to all of you guys, because I know you're super busy, um, you know, clinics are super busy right now. And uh, I know life is just crazy. So thank you for taking the time to watch wherever you are in the world, whether or not you're having breakfast or coffee or on a break, a lunch break, uh, which never happens in the veterinary clinic. Uh, don't forget to fill out your seat, the uh, survey, which is uh, in the chat link below. Uh, that's going to close out in about 22 minutes, uh, just to confirm that you attended live. And um, let's go ahead and uh, just do one more question. All right, uh, this one is on coccidia. And um, Dr. Little, I just wanna thank you for this um, YouTube live, it's super practical and I love it. And when people ask me a coccidia question, I'm like, I have no idea, I'm emergency. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there any significant difference between canine and rabbit coccidia and the treatment needed for both uh, if you see coccidia on a fecal? Yeah, so coccidia on a fecal, it should be distinguished between cystoisospora, the coccidia that infects dogs, or cystoisospora canis or a hyalensis complex, other cystoisospora species infect cats, and then imeria species infect rabbits. And so there's not cross-infection. You don't have to worry about that. Now, dogs will sometimes have rabbit coccidia, 
in their fecal, but that's because of coprophagy, because a dog that finds rabbit feces in his backyard is usually a pretty happy dog, right? And so they're going to shed this hymeria um, oocyst, and they'll show up on the fecal results, but they're not clinically significant. They don't need to be treated. That's one of the false positives I had in kind of air quotes on the slide, because it is a true positive. It's really Imeria, but the dog's not infected, doesn't need to be treated. Um, I will say that we do sometimes see emergency coccidia cases, though, so I feel like I should bring that up, because in a very young dog that gets an overwhelming coccidia infection, it can be fatal. Um, mm -hmm. Off-label use of panazeril is phenomenal to clear those in, to clear those infections and recover those dogs, um, but you're right. The majority of the time we see it, it's a clinically normal dog. They're just shedding a few oasis, and they're going to be fine so yeah i will will say when i see parvo cases they usually yeah. have toxicity with yeah. them and thankfully the amazing veterinary technicians that i work with especially ones that used to be in gp i'd be like which dewormer and they'll just rattle it off yeah <laughs> so yeah. It's interesting. awesome well thank you so much dr little really appreciate it i also wanted to put a plug save the date for september 17th which i know feels like far away but it's actually really really uh rapidly approaching um dr little will also be talking about um, more canine parasite zoonotic risk as a webinar so that one will be totally free and open again again that's september 17th at 8 p.m uh, so you want to save the date uh, east coast time uh with that again a huge thank you to dr little and to Alenko. please feel free to type in uh notes into the uh any kind of comments into the chat and we'll make sure to pass that on to um, Alenko and Dr. Little. And with that, thank you guys all so much. Really appreciate all that you do. And again, a huge thank you, Dr. Little. Thanks, everybody. This was great.